Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here. Welcome back to the railway and welcome back to another review. It's another good day today because Hornby have just released a brand new steam locomotive. Quite a major release and we're going to take a look at it today. <laughs> Today's locomotive literally arrived in the post just yesterday and I've been able to hold off looking at it until now so I am incredibly excited. That's probably quite unprofessional but I can't help it, it's the way I feel. So the locomotive is this, it is the brand new Hornby Thompson Class A2 slash 2 and in real life at least these locomotives were very controversial. They represent a great interference from Edward Thompson onto the design by Sir Nigel Gresley because these locomotives used to be the beautiful P2s until Edward Thompson came along and rebuilt them into these and from some angles these look absolutely fine but look at the positioning of the cylinders there I think that is the major bugbear for most people I hate to say this there's no reflection of Hornby but from some angles these locos are pretty hideous aren't they um, you don't have to agree with that but yeah as soon as I noticed those cylinders there I, I do have that opinion anyway I'm hoping the locomotive will be fantastic though it sure should be because it has an ROP of £189.99 and I paid £171 from Hattons and if I can get an affiliate link in time I will post that in the description so you can see the other versions of this class made available so obviously that is an unreal amount of money that is very very in fact I can't believe I have spent that on this locomotive but as I often say an incredibly high price commands an incredibly impressive model and therefore my expectations are really really high for this locomotive as should be clear there's no room for sloppy quality here there's no room for poor performance and so therefore this locomotive should be excellent and I'm hoping to really enjoy it I'm also hoping for some die cast at least a die cast running plate on this and I think I have reason to hope for that actually because obviously recently Hornby announced an upgraded A1 and A3 locomotive which does have the die cast running plate which obviously suggests that Hornby see the value in that feature and therefore are they really going to release a brand new expensive locomotive without that feature? I hope not for the price I sincerely hope not. So come with me today we're going to find out exactly what this really interesting and unusual locomotive is like and figure out together whether or not this is worth the money. Should be fun let's give it a try. And even though these are not the nicest looking locomotives in the world, I'm still so glad that Hornby decided to produce these because I've always found them fascinating. The idea that a locomotive like the P2 can be completely transformed into a locomotive that looks absolutely nothing like it is fascinating as far as I'm concerned. I mean, don't get me wrong, in order to have the privilege of looking at this model today, I probably won't be able to afford to eat now for the rest of the month. So if in the next video I'm nothing more than a skeleton, then you can blame Hornby. But yeah, in all seriousness, I can't wait to see what Hornby have been able to do with this class. First though, let me show you the end of the box. So the version I went for is 3830, and there is a good reason why I went for that one. It's in the early BR livery, and it is a Thompson Class A2 slash 2, and it is a 462, not a 282 as was the case with the P2 and it is Cock of the North number 60501. So this is what became of the famous P2 locomotive, the one that I've showed so many times in my videos. Yeah, this is how it ended up. Uh, it's a bit sad, actually, isn't it? Because I do think the P2s looked better than whatever this monstrosity is. But again, it's just the, the story itself and the history behind it. It's fascinating stuff. Right, let me show you the back of the box then. So these were classified as an 8P or a 7F. So like the P2, even though there's two less driving wheels now, still very, very powerful locomotives. There's the history in the middle of the box. As always, if you want to pause and read that, you can do. And then on the end of the box, my favourite part of the package, you can see the drawings that Humby will have done to help them produce the, the locomotive. There's even measurements for the wheels and such. And yeah, that is dated 2019. So yeah, seriously, this is a brand new locomotive, literally only just released. So let's get this open. I literally have held off. How do I do it? I really don't know. It's like one of the worst things, not being able to open locomotives when they come. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, taking candy from a baby. But no, we're going to be opening this right now. And look there. That looks really, really smart. There's something about the wheels on this that looks really good. I don't know how to pinpoint that. Maybe that will become more obvious <laughs> when we get this out. Maybe it won't. Maybe that's just me rambling like a madman. Yeah, already this looks superb. And I think the livery looks really quite subtle, doesn't it? It's not popping too much. Not muted, but 
refined, I would say. Anyway, let's find out what this is like because I'm finding it hard to hold off any longer. Let's have a look at the operating and maintenance instructions first of all. So here it is, the A2 slash 2 and the A2 slash 3. So obviously they must have the same or at least similar chassis. On the inside, let's have a look at this for the first time. So lubrication, yeah, it's all these standard lubrication points. Fitting the accessories, okay, so we'll have a look in the accessory bag. Assembly or disassembly shows you how to connect the loco and tender. Body removal, oh look, we're not seeing too much in the way of the mechanism, so we'll have to open the thing up and find out. Decoder socket in the tender by the looks of it. And on the back, yet yeah, the usual bit about the brake rods. So that's all fairly standard, or oh, it's not revealing much about the model though, is it? So yeah, it's still very much going to be a surprise, I think, getting this out. So let's do exactly that. Let's take a look. How's the weight feeling? Yeah, it's feeling reasonably heavy, actually. We'll get it on the scales, though, of course. Right, here we go. Accessory bag. So, as the instructions promised, you've got the brake rigging for the locomotive, painted cylinder drain cocks. Again, they're not popping, are they? They're subtle looking. And then what look like some steps, yeah, pair of steps as well. One glaring omission here is the rear pony axle with the flanges on it, meaning that you're just stuck with the flangeless version on this model. I think, given how expensive this was, it wouldn't have killed them to include that alternative axle, would it? I really hope there aren't any more omissions from this model, given just how expensive it was. So there we go, everything else is pre-fitted to the model, which is great. Speaking of which, let's open this up and have a look, shall we? Be very careful with this. Do you notice how much more careful I am when a model costs nearly £200? <laughs> Cool, blimey, look at that. Yeah, that livery, we'll have to compare it to some other of the sort of BR Brunswick Green locos I've got, see if it if it's any different to them. Anyway, let's lift it up. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, it might be an ugly locomotive, prototypically speaking, but this thing looks fantastic. It's nicely put together. Unfortunately, the running plate, the foot plate, is just plastic on this. You can tell just by touching it. That is crazy for the price tag, quite frankly. At that price, I would want every possible feature and more besides in order for this to be worth it. So I suppose that's a little bit disappointing. But no, in terms of the level of detail, this thing looks really, really impressive. I'm quite excited now to explore this one and see what Hornby have done with it. First though, let's have a little bit of history on the prototype and then we'll take a close look at some of the details. Here we go. So the Thompson Class A2, not to be confused with the Peppercorn A2, which I have done in the past, so yep, yeah, guilty, I'll hold my hands up there. This particular class was introduced in 1943. As I said, it was a rebuild of the earlier P2 class, designed, of course, by Sir Nigel Gresley, which incidentally made Thompson rather unpopular, to say the very least. Only six locomotives were rebuilt in total, and they featured a newly designed front bogey, a shortened boiler, divided drive, which means you've got more than one axle uh, driven by the cylinders. I think it's two axles in this case. Uh, it has the original connecting rods though, and of course, in order to achieve that latter point, the outside cylinders had to be placed behind the bogey, giving the class that unbalanced and some would say hideous, in fact, I would probably say that as well, appearance. The design was reportedly not terribly successful, which is pretty embarrassing for Thompson, actually, given the fact that he felt it necessary to ruin such a beautiful class such as the P2s, yet they were prone to excessive wheel slip, apparently, reliability issues caused by frame movement, which caused components to work themselves loose and stuff, and as a result, the class was up for early withdrawal from 1959 onwards with non-preserved. So it's a sad end, really, to what was, in the beginning, a really beautiful class of steam locomotives. Okay, so there it is, the brand new Hornby Thompson Class A2 slash 2, up close and personal for you. I don't know. I really don't know, folks. It's all right. I will say it's all right. It's by no means a terrible model. It just goes back to what I said at the start. For over £170, this model needed to be packed with incredible features, and it needed to be truly high quality in order for that price to be justified. And the sad truth is that, in my opinion, it just isn't. It's just a number of smallish things which add together to make the model a bit more mediocre than I perhaps expected it to be. So we'll start with the obvious one. One, and that is, of course, the lack of die-cast foot plate. Now, yes, this affects the weight. The loco weighs in at 446 grams, which is a good weight. I mean, that is quite heavy. However, that is about 40 grams lighter than the Backman Peppercorn A2, despite that being a lighter locomotive in real life. But that isn't even the biggest deal. Yes, I'd rather this was heavier, of course, and it certainly would be, had Hornby given us what we'd paid for and fitted the die-cast foot plate. But that isn't even the biggest issue. If we look at the rear pony truck, as you can see, that is part 
part of the chassis and it is made of metal. Look at the finish on that. Look how metallic it looks. Look at the satin finish on that. Then contrast that to the plastic running plate and as is quite clear, it just looks flat, doesn't it? And that leads us nicely onto the next issue with this and it is just the plastic flat finish. If I show you the boiler, you can see there's a little bit of reflection going on, but if I keep the shot exactly the same and substitute in the Backman Peppercorn A2, wow. Suddenly that finish looks absolutely incredible and look at the difference in the livery as well When I first saw the Hornby A2 I thought yeah the livery looks fairly subtle and not too overstated But then compare it with other locomotives on the market from other manufacturers It starts to look a little bit feeble doesn't it and that isn't entirely down to just the finish either If we look closely at the lining yeah you can see it isn't finished to the highest quality You've got mismatches there not lining up properly there are even sections of the lining which are missing entirely that's not the best and then you've got this really ugly parting line that goes right across the top of the locomotive now hold your horses because before we jump on Hornby for this if you look at the diagram you can see that there is a line there so that is kind of prototypical but if we look at the model it's really irregular and uneven you've got sections which are much more noticeable than others it just looks a mess so even that is a little bit of a problem and on top of that there are other quality issues as well I mean there's quite a lot of wonky parts You've got this lamp bracket on the front of the smoke box, which has just been glued on in completely the wrong angle. You've got foot plate detailing, which is all sort of off kilter and wonky looking. Again, not easy to fix that without prying them off and re-gluing them. You've got the bracing just below the smoke box here. Look, it's not even touching the foot plate. How did that get past any quality checks? Yeah, I just feel for £189.99, we might have perhaps deserved an etched nameplate instead of this plastic one, which doesn't look great. Yeah, it's just light on features. Where's the firebox glow? The vast majority of the new releases that I've looked at recently, particularly the super expensive ones, have had that. Now look at the cab detail. It's a really nicely detailed cab, but there's no paintwork on the gauges or anything. And the previous LNER Pacifics from Hornby did have painted gauges. So that is a definite step down in detail, despite the massive steps up in price that we've seen over recent years. Yeah, I just feel a little bit disappointed in this one, particularly in just the finish of the locomotive. It just looks so washed out, doesn't it? Compared with other early BR locomotives I have in my collection. So yeah, it's a horrible green. And I understand, yeah, different works would have mixed their own versions of the BR green. And so there would have been some variations in real life. But come on Hornby, that was an opportunity. That was your golden ticket to pick a green that just pops and looks amazing. And nobody would have been able to say it was wrong and instead they chose this washed out horrible green which just doesn't look very nice. I don't understand it, I really don't. I, I really wanted to like this when I got it out but I just feel like it's let me down for how much it cost. If this was a more reasonably priced locomotive I think these issues would be much more forgivable but at this price point it just had to impress me and unfortunately the locomotive did not. However there is an awful lot of good on this model which I think we need to address as well. First of all there is quite a bit of metal detailing so you've got the reverser rod here that is a nice metal piece and it, it shows it looks like it's made of metal and not just cheap plastic so that is a decent step up you've got the safety valves in front of the cab here again these are made of metal which look great you've still got that mismatch between the safety valves and the whistle which is a much smaller finer piece just made of plastic pity about that but overall that is a very very minor complaint the top of the cab does have the opening air intakes for the sort of crew for their comfort so I'll show you that while we're there yeah that's quite a nice little inclusion you've got plenty of lining on the locomotive as well most of it is done better than it was on the boiler so if we look at the running plate despite it being an odd shaped running plate with quite a lot of <laughs> undulations the decoration there is fantastic as it is on the side of the cab as well and I'm pleased to say that that gold fleck paint which Hornby used to use on some of their models which looked so so bad is gone you can actually read that builder's plate now which is excellent you've got a nicely represented double chimney here which is finished off with these bizarre fins which are sort of fitted to the top of the smoke box I'm guessing they must be of strange design of smoke deflector designed to sort of draft the smoke up out of the way of the locomotive that's a very very unusual design I don't think I've seen that on any other locomotive I've reviewed before so that's really interesting 
The smoke box, despite being slightly spoiled by the sloppy assembly on that lamp bracket, it is nicely detailed. You've got the separately fitted handrail, you've got the running number printed onto the front, and the separately fitted handle for the smoke box. The buffer beams are at least nicely put together. You have the separately fitted vacuum pipes on there, as well as the metal buffers, which are sprung. Let me show you that. So yeah, we do have sprung buffers. And then you've got a number of separately fitted handrails and quite a bit of pipe work as well, which all looks absolutely fine. Yes, nothing wrong with that at all. The cab is nicely finished with flush glazing. Yeah, that's all right. It's all nicely fitted. You've got pre-fitted cab doors, which is good. And then what looks like a moving tender four plate. This one is not just fixed in an unrealistic position. You can actually pose this if you like. Again, it's not been painted properly. You can see where the base material color is showing through. But overall, yeah, that's a nice feature. And as I've said, the cab detail is all right. I will show you that again. You can see some of the various components picked out there. Not as good as from Hornby in the past though, which is again puzzling and disappointing given the price. Let's take a look at the wheel set. Again, you've got these nicely molded wheels, which are realistic right down to the axles, which is great. And again, very fine coupling and connecting rods, as you'd always expect from Hornby. They look absolutely fine. And I can't wait to see those up and running, actually. And then you've got this whole front bogey area, which because of the placement of the cylinders is quite exposed. You can see a lot of the chassis there. And so it's a good job that they have put the rivet details on there. And it's die cast as well. So you've got that nice metallic finish to it. Let's take a look at the tender then. I mean, it's the same story really the decoration is about the same as you'd expect nicely applied early british railways crest that looks pretty decent you've got the standard sort of underframe detailing we've seen similar tenders to this before but it does look pretty decent with the brake rigging fitted as you can see nice realistic and fine scale coal fitted inside the bunker there and that is removable so if it isn't to your cup of tea even though it looks really realistic you can of course remove it and fit your own if you wish and then around the back the tender is adorned with more separately fitted handrails steps lamp brackets vacuum pipes, more sprung buffers, and of course the separately fitted NEM slim tension lock coupling. And that is the only coupling supplied with the locomotive. There was no extra coupling to fit to the front if you wanted to do that, so there's just no way of doing that as far as I'm aware. And there were also no screw link couplings included in the accessories bag as well, which again just goes back to what I was saying about this being a little bit light on features. So yeah, it's a fairly mediocre model. I think if this was, say, if this had cost me £20 less, I'd be able to understand some of the cost-saving features, such as the plastic running plate and slightly careless assembly but at this price point unfortunately that is not the case anyway we'll take a look at the mechanism fingers crossed this is good because that could be the saving grace for this locomotive then we'll get it down onto the track and give it its first ever test please do keep those fingers crossed so there it is then, down onto the track, the A2 slash 2. Yeah, I would say it's looking decent, it's just that colour. I can't get over that colour. If anything, it looks even worse and more unnatural under my sort of house lights. Yeah, I don't know about that. And again, I want to apologise if I seem like I'm at all vexed or grumpy in this video. The fact is these videos shouldn't be too personal. But at the end of the day, I bought this model. It was my money. I was really looking forward to it. And when you feel that disappointment because the product isn't what you'd hoped it would be, you just can't help but take that personally. But I'll, I'll try not to be too sort of grumpy about this. Overall, though, the mechanism itself is actually really, really decent. I did find a couple of glaring emissions which are a little bit puzzling and one potentially much more serious issue which has got me a little bit nervous but we'll start positive first of all so all of the loco driving wheels have pickups fitted to them as you can see as well as the tender pickups so connection to the track should be absolutely fine removing the base keeper plate reveals that we do have proper turned metal bearings fitted to the driving axles which is fantastic you've got a single driven axle in the middle so that should be nice and even and at the back you've got those spring-loaded electrical contacts which makes the base keeper plate removal really really easy. The body removal was quite easy as well, just two screws and you've got the chassis there which is made of metal, nice die cast chassis. There is the five pole skew wound motor which is very good. Notice there are no LEDs at the back of the chassis there so we don't have any firebox glow. Again for the price that is an unfortunate omission and another glaring omission is the lack of flywheel as well. Why not? This is such a huge locomotive. Are you telling me you could not find a way to fit a flywheel inside this locomotive given how much it cost? I really don't know. Anyway, the serious issue I found was with the gauging and the issue comes from the fact that the tyres are not actually fitted perfectly flush with the plastic wheels. So you've got the wheels which are gauged a little bit tight, I think around 14.7 millimetres around there, but then 
the tyres make the gauging even tighter so that they range between 14.7 millimetres and 14.9 millimetres, which means on average the back-to-back -back gauge is 0.4 millimetres too tight. That is quite a lot, that is more than I normally see on these locomotives. The front-to-back gauge isn't as bad, it's only 0.2 millimetres too tight as a result of the flanges being quite slim, which is the saving grace. Overall though, yeah, the mechanism seems alright, I just really hope that gauging issue doesn't cause problems around the curves because that is a little bit on the tight side. Anyway, enough about that. Let me set this to forwards and let's give it a little power. It hasn't been run in yet, so this might not be its best. Obviously, I won't draw any firm conclusions on the performance until running in has concluded. But here we go, turning it up now. And the thing is moving. And actually, that does seem pretty smooth, doesn't it? I wouldn't say that's cogging. All right, yes, that's nice. That is a nice runner, 50% speed. All right, so maybe you get away with that then, Hornby, because that motor seems to be running really, really nicely to say that's not yet been run in. Pity about the lack of flywheel, though, because if you've got any interruptions to the power, which is admittedly unlikely, uh, you will see a, a real dead stop like that, as opposed to the flywheel taking over for a second or two until power is restored. So you could start to see sort of jerky running uh, if your track is dirty or if the wheels become dirty. But then again, the number of pickups makes that fairly unlikely. So yeah, it's not a huge issue. Oh, I tell you what, overall I am a bit disappointed with this, but that smooth running is really, really breathtaking, isn't it? Not so good in reverse, perhaps a little bit um, inconsistent in reverse. But when I did that forwards, look at that. Finally, we're starting to see some signs that this model is worth over 170 pounds. That is marvelous. Go on, let's go 50% up and down. It's not too fast up and down at 50% speed, as you can see. Yeah, it's actually really quite competently geared, which is great. Uh, let's try the crawl, let's zoom in. Go on then, this is the crawl out of the box. Yeah, it's all right that, isn't it? I suppose because the flywheel isn't fitted, there's probably a little bit less strain on the motor, there's a little bit less work for it to do, I suppose. Maybe that's why it's a bit more controllable. But this is better, much, much better than the other Hornby Pacifics I've reviewed recently. In fact, you haven't seen the reviews yet, but they are coming. They don't run as well as this, you'll see that. Yeah, okay, okay, performance looks great. Or at least it does on straight track. How's it gonna handle my curves? <laughs> oh, that sounds a bit kinky. <laughs> Come on then, let's go, let's find out. 40%. Okay, let's see, fingers crossed. Here they come, second radius curves. Wow, it didn't care. That has really impressed me because with gauging as tight as that, I'm expecting there to be some serious pinching around those second radius curves. And the fact that the loco doesn't slow down at all over them suggests that there is some serious torque in that mechanism. So I would guess that the motors in here are real, real quality. To run this well without a flywheel and with dodgy gauging, they've got to be some fantastic motors. So finally, there is one area of this model that has really, really impressed me. And I'm glad, because that's gonna help the score a little bit, isn't it? Wow, great performer, it seems, straight out of the box. Presumably, it's only going to get better, so I'll see you in a little while after the running in has completed, and we'll experience this loco in peak working condition, hopefully. All right, see you in a sec. Okay, folks, there we go. Running in has concluded, and that was absolutely fine. It ran beautifully. I did hear the occasional click come out of it, but I've tried to isolate where it's coming from. It just doesn't happen when I'm looking for it. It's very rare. No, the performance overall is absolutely fantastic. Perfectly constant, really nice and quiet. For quite a large locomotive, this thing is very, very graceful and almost silent on the tracks. Yeah, really, really good performer. Right, let's see if the crawl is even better now. I mean, it was really good to start with maybe it could have been a little bit slower so let's find out now here we go i'm turning it up forwards oh blimey now to say that this is a large loco with a fair bit of weight on board and quite a lot in the way of valve gear and coupling rods and all of that stuff <laughs> that is really really impressive isn't it wow and backwards as well in fact it's equally good backwards too let's go a bit quicker look how Look how even the motion is there. It doesn't fluctuate at all. It's almost completely constant. Look at that, all the way around. That is a great, great performer. 
I wish I could give it five plus on performance. Yeah, that's great. So the pulling power is okay. It's not particularly mighty, but it's not uh, sort of weak or anything. Uh, 0 0.45 newtons of tractive effort, that should be enough for this thing to haul around 27 coaches on straight and level track. And because these were such beefy locomotives in real life, I've given this quite a considerable train, actually. I've given it eight coaches, and that will really test this up Gordon's Hill and around those curves. If there is any weakness in this model in terms of taking curves and gradients, I think testing with eight coaches ought to reveal it. So. Let's go and find out. Let's set to reverse. Off we go. Let's see how the coupling goes. Okay. Yeah, that was absolutely fine. It's just so beautifully controllable. It really, really is. Come on then. So let's start off with the coaches. Let's see if it can still crawl on the load. It's just taking up the slack right now. Yep, seems it can. Look at that. Seriously, this is one of the best running Pacifics I've ever tried. It's probably even better than the Princess and the uh, Coronation. Yeah, that is really, really good. Okay, speeding up then, turning us up. Let's hit sort of 40, 40, 50. Look at that, absolutely fine. And then on the inside line, I'm going to run the other A2 I have. It's a different design, of course. This is the Peppercorn A2. There we go. This is a Backman model, and yeah, as you can see, the livery just looks so much better on that, doesn't it? Uh, not so good mechanically, though, the Backman ones. And then on the inside line, I have the Hornby A1 Tornado, a railroad locomotive, really, but still more powerful than the new A2, which is a bit confusing. But anyway, enjoy the running session and see if you can spot what the theme is with the locomotives in the sidings. All right, with a load then, let's see how this handles the curves. Look at that, next to no slowing down at all. The torque inside this is just incredible. So, I mean, it's an ugly brute, isn't it? Partly due to the prototype being ugly, partly due to the horrible, washed-out, sickly green. <laughs> but you can't deny this is a fantastic, fantastic runner. Easily one of the best I've seen, and probably the best Pacific I've ever run as well. And unlike in real life, this runs much better than my Hornby P2 does with its sort of rubbishy three-pole motor. Yeah, it's a really, really good runner. Thank goodness that one aspect of this model is super, super impressive. The performance is wonderful. Love it. Really love it. All right, let's have some ratings then for the brand new Hornby Class A2 slash 2. Now, the level of detail was actually really quite decent. I've given it four stars. Yeah, there were quite a few nice details. I like the metal separately fitted parts. That was pretty good. So the safety valves, the reversing rod. Yep, yeah, they were pretty decent. You've got some nice painted cab detail. Not quite as good as on other Hornby models, unfortunately, but still pretty decent. And overall, the decoration's fairly good, etc., etc. However, I have decided to knock off a star just because of the finish and the livery. Now, I'm no livery expert by any means, but I know what looks good and what looks bad. And it's not all down to the colour either, it's just the plasticky finish. It just does not look like a steam locomotive, it looks like a plastic toy. And that's a problem for me after I've spent the best part of £200 on it. The performance, though, is really, really good. I cannot fault the performance. Much, much better than I expected, given the lack of flywheel. Fantastic slow speed, no noticeable slowdowns, even on the gradient and on the second radius curves. Yeah, it's a stellar performer. Really, really nice and smooth, well-balanced. What more can I say? Really, really good runner. The pulling power is okay. It's not particularly impressive. It's not egregiously bad either. The tractive effort was 0.45 newtons. Had the loco been fitted with the die-cast running plate, this would have been a much better puller. And it is less powerful than the Hornby Britannia, and it's even less powerful than the Hornby Tornado, which is in the railroad range. Overall, it's a fair puller though. The mechanism, I've given four stars. Yep, yeah, the mechanism's fantastic. You've got tons of pickups, proper metal bearings, five pole skew wound motor, just a lack of flywheel though, so it loses a mark for that. However, it doesn't really show through in the performance too much, so do bear that in mind. The quality is where this low coat loses quite a few points though, and it's a real, real shame about that. For a start, there's just far too much plastic, that's what I will say. 
plastic body, plastic running plate, it's only really the chassis and some of the minor detailing that is made of metal and that really shows through. The chassis looks fantastic, really glossy, really metallic finish. The running plate, the boiler looks really plasticky and that's a real shame. You've also got issues with the gauging, issues with the assembly, the thing hasn't been put together very well. Yeah, the quality loses quite a few marks, as does the value for money really. The ROP, £189.99, and I bought this for £171 from Hattons. It's just too expensive. At that price, it needed to be packed with features and it needed to have every possible box ticked, including the die-cast box, including the good-looking livery box, including the put-together properly box. There are too many issues, too many omissions for this to get a good score on the value for money, and even little details like the etched nameplates and the flickering firebox glow. Really, for £189.99 RRP, they couldn't have been included? No, I don't understand that. So that has pulled the overall score down, unfortunately, to 6.61 out of 10. Let's put that into the logbook then. There it is, fifth, just above the LMS 10,000 and below the web coal tank. Overall, yeah, a little bit disappointing. Not a bad model by any means. It's very nicely detailed and it works perfectly. It's just not as good as it needed to be to justify that price tag. And I think when other manufacturers at the moment, even including Backman, have produced models at this kind of price point, they have been better. The other thing I don't get is why are they bothering to upgrade their old A1s and A3s to have die-cast running plates when their newly tooled Pacifics aren't having them fitted? That is just strange to me. I don't understand why they would do that. One area of this model that I haven't really covered is the accuracy. I've heard it said that this is a really faithful representation of the A2-2. Whether that's true or not, I'm not entirely sure. Obviously, that is well outside my area of expertise. But if you do believe the experts, this is supposed to be a really accurate locomotive, so bear that in mind. So I would say, yes, the model is probably very, very accurate, but if it's not built properly and it doesn't look right, then that doesn't really count for very much, does it? But sure, yeah, if all of the rivets are in the right place and such, great. But if it was left to me, I would rather have a higher quality model that was put together properly and had a really, really nice finish. But you let me know down in the comments, what would you prefer? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't enjoy this as much as I hoped I would. I know that sounds dead miserable, but no, I was just so excited for it. It cost me so much. I was ready to be impressed. I was ready to be blown away. And at the end of the day, while aspects of the model are really impressive, the features, the quality, the finish, they're all basically in line with Hornby's much older LNER Pacifics from sort of 2006, 2007. I don't know, I think the price suggested these models would be so much more than they are, and the fact that they weren't put together properly is just a bit unforgivable, isn't it? But overall, yeah, they're not bad models at all. If you've got money to burn, apparently they're very realistic. They are very, very good runners. And I suppose if you got one of the other liveries that maybe looked a little bit better and a little bit less washed out, I don't know, maybe you'd be more impressed. If you want to check out some of the other A2 2s that are going to be available from Hornby, I do have affiliate links down in the description. But there you go, that is my honest reaction to the new Hornby A2 2. I'm not going to tell you to go out and buy one, and at the same time, I'm not going to say, don't go out and buy one. I would just say, look closely, ignore what I've said if you want to, look closely at the locomotive, I've giving you lots and lots of close-ups and make your own decision and let me know down in the comments what your thoughts are as well of course but for now thank you very very much for watching lots more new locomotives on the way this year so hopefully some of them will be much much better than this one was but overall yeah it's fair enough it's okay i don't know if i regret i suppose i do regret it a little bit i think i could have spent 171 pounds in a much better way but you know you win some you lose some i've done this for enough years to know what i'm getting myself into but thanks for watching, you take care, see you on the next one. Cheers folks.